Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and um, begin our presentation today for our October brown bag event with CM2, the Cooperative Mobility for Competitive Meg Regions. Um, I'm Sandra Charletta. I'm the Assistant Director of Administration for CM2. And um, I wanted to go ahead and begin today's presentation by introducing both of our guest speakers. So first, uh, we will have Dr. Rydell Lothel um, talk to us about his uh, research with Dr. Walton uh, for their third year report, Freight Mega Regional Planning and Financial Policy. After his uh, presentation, we'll have a short Q&A for anybody who has questions. And then we will then transfer it over to Zhu Yang Li, who will be sharing his presentation on um, a scheduling algorithm for hurricane evacuation. And after his presentation, we'll have another Q&A. So those are our guest speakers. I'll go ahead and end my screen sharing so that Dr. Waffle can begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, let me Um, are y'all seeing the presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming and listening. Um, not a doctor yet, but uh, hopefully soon. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the report that Dr. Walton and I recently finished for CM2. Uh, freight maker regional planning and financial policy. Um, this report is uh, primarily going to focus in on uh, state level fuel taxes and the implication that the difference in how the taxes administered between states can have for future transportation funding policies. So the outline for today's talk, I'm going to spend the first section talking about uh, how the fuel taxes vary between states. And then uh, that will entail both uh, talk about the difference rates and the difference in administration. I'll transition to talking about uh, specifically uh, freight vehicles and how their uh, differences from passenger vehicles interact with the uh, transportation financing. And then how uh, some proposed new transportation financing strategies might play out based on what we know from existing uh, state fuel taxes and then a brief conclusion about how uh, mega regions can play a part. So starting with uh, transportation financing and state level fuel taxes, and starting with the gasoline tax, there is a lot of variability between states. Um, California, Pennsylvania, and Illinois have uh, by far the highest rates in the country. Um, over double the rates of the uh, states with the smallest gasoline fuel taxes. Uh, Alaska has the smallest at only 32 cents per gallon. Um, and uh, several southern and southwestern states also have uh, very low rates. Um, Pennsylvania is the only state that does not have a direct fuel tax. Um, every other state has a direct excise tax on um, on fuel, whereas Pennsylvania charges uh, the wholesale distributors. So here is a map of the actual gasoline tax rates. Um, and as I mentioned, the southern and southwestern states tend to have the lowest, um, whereas the rest of the country, it varies uh, uh, a good deal. And um, just that's a fairly wide range where um, uh, two, two and a half times, e even sometimes just crossing a state border. Um, particularly, you can see like in the uh, Missouri, Illinois uh, area. For diesel taxes, 
it's, uh, it follows a somewhat similar trend. Um, on average, diesel taxes across the country are uh, higher, um, but most of that difference is caused by the six cent difference in federal fuel taxes. There's, there's about a seven cent difference on average across the country, but um, nearly all of that is caused by the difference in federal fuel, fuel taxes. In fact, there are 10 states that have a higher gasoline tax than their diesel tax. Um, California and Pennsylvania, though, have um, uh, not only higher diesel taxes than the gasoline taxes like the federal tax, but um, it is uh, considerably higher, uh, about 15 cents higher in uh, California and Pennsylvania. And um, that uh, largely stems from um, environmental motivations with uh, diesel being um, more harmful to the environment. They've imposed a uh, higher rate as sort of a Pigovian measure. Uh, the map of uh, diesel tax rates uh, across the country is um, fairly similar. Um, and you can see that California, Illinois, and Pennsylvania, again, have the highest rates. In the side-by-side -side comparison, you can see that um, most states tend to follow similar trends, um, although uh, particularly in the Northeast, there seems to be more variability. One thing we examined in detail was the legislation affecting state fuel taxes. As we all know, it's been um, many years, in fact, uh, this month marks 27 years since the federal uh, fuel taxes have been increased, but that's only one data point. And by examining the state fuel taxes, we can get 50 more data points about uh, just how politically feasible it is to change fuel taxes. And um, there has been a lot more movement at the state level. Um, so what this map is showing is how recently each state has uh, changed their fuel taxes um, in almost every case increasing their uh, fuel tax rate. Um, and the uh, light tan is uh, states that have not uh, done anything in the past decade, but um, most states, 32 states, have um, passed legislation to update their uh, fuel taxes. Um, so that would imply that uh, at the state level, at least, it uh, seems to be politically more feasible to um, change transportation finance policy than at the federal level. And um, we also looked at some of the peculiarities of certain states. Um, some do have uh, rates that are continuously indexed and updated according to inflation. Um, some index based on the price of gasoline uh, rather than uh, the consumer price index. Um, but there are also, uh, there's a growing trend of uh, states that have um, implemented indexing and then uh, repealed it more recently. Um, Massachusetts only had uh, fuel tax indexing for less than a year before its measure was repealed. Um, so uh, overall, that's a fairly small number of states. So while uh, increasing the rate uh, manually year on year by legislation seems to be more feasible, um, indexing is uh, fairly difficult at the state level, uh, like it has been at the federal level. The next thing we examined through the states is the actual revenue that these fuel taxes generated. Um, there's the open question of uh, how much do fuel tax increases incentivize people to purchase more efficient vehicles. Um, 
And of course, there's the growing trend of uh, vehicles becoming more efficient, which is, in addition to inflation is one of the reasons why fuel taxes have been um, seeing diminishing real revenues. So uh, we wanted to examine um, how much power states have to increase their transportation funding through fuel taxes. Um, it's worth noting that uh, Across the country, fuel taxes account for about a quarter of uh, state transportation funding with uh, vehicle registration uh, representing um, another, the, the next largest share. And uh, then the accounting becomes difficult depending on how you uh, account for uh, bond uh, funds that are paid back over a long time period. Um, so, what we did is we calculated the expected revenue for each state based on the amount of VMT in the state and the, um, uh, the average uh, rate across the country. Um, or sorry, the, the VMT in each state, the average fuel efficiency across the country and the uh, rate in each state. Um, so, uh, states that are below this line are bringing in less revenue than you would expect, which could imply that uh, either for small states, people are uh, filling up their vehicles on the other side of the border, or more generally, uh, we'd expect um, people on average have more fuel efficient vehicles in those states. Um, the extent to which it follows the uh, expected trend line means that um, as we would expect there is a very small amount of uh, um, there's a very large amount of uh, predictableness the um, the amount of driving is inelastic uh, compared to the fuel tax rate uh, which since the amount of driving is generally fairly inelastic compared to fuel prices that are uh, higher than the tax rate overall, this was an expected result. Uh, but it's still useful to look at uh, which states are falling um, on which side of the line. And um, so we have two of the states with the highest rates, California and Pennsylvania, falling on either side, um, which gives more anecdotal evidence that the rate is not uh, playing as large a role as other policies. California is below the line and uh, there have been a lot of um, incentives for, uh, fuel, for purchasing fuel efficient vehicles in California for environmental reasons. Um, so policies that are outside of the fuel tax uh, influencing that. Um, we also see highly urban states, uh, for example, New Jersey is uh, below the line. So one thing that could imply is that uh, with more urban driving, which uh, um, you could have uh, smaller vehicles that are more fuel efficient, whereas a um, state that uh, would have a lot of uh, trucks and larger vehicles like Texas uh, ends up above the line here. Um, so interesting to look at uh, where different states are falling and uh, what that could imply for uh, the usefulness of using a uh, fuel tax to um, influence policy. The Next thing I'm going to look at is just discussing a bit about um, the peculiarities of uh, freight vehicles. Um, they have a lower per mile efficiency and they pay a higher uh, per volume rate. Um, meaning they do pay more per mile traveled, but they also uh, consume orders of magnitude more pavement than passenger vehicles on a per distance basis. 
Um, so uh, going through the average fuel efficiency over the last few decades, we determined that um, on average, heavy duty vehicles are uh, paying about five times more per mile than light duty vehicles. Um, so they're paying five times more, but uh, the actual uh, consumption of pavement that they do on a pure mile basis could be um, many hundreds times more uh, than a light duty vehicle. So uh, in transportation finance, we do have that discrepancy. There is also a lot of price variability in diesel. Um, and compared to the fairly consistent rate of diesel fuel taxes, um, the actual price of a gallon of diesel has changed uh, quite a lot over, uh, this is looking at the last decade uh, with um, monthly values from the EIA. And um, with how much the base price changes, the relatively low amount of the diesel fuel tax, uh, we would expect not to provide a large incentive towards, um, uh, on its own, towards making uh, freight vehicles more efficient. Next, I'm gonna look at uh, what the previous discussion means for some proposed um, newer transportation funding strategies, primarily going to look at road user charges, also called VMT taxes. Um, they've been commonly suggested as an alternative to the fuel tax because they uh, are able to get around the um, fuel efficiency issue entirely because you would be charging a rate directly by the mile. It uh, doesn't matter how much fuel a vehicle uses in that mile. Um, they've been used for uh, a long time in other countries. Uh, New Zealand has had a road user charge for more than 40 years, and they've been piloted in some states like Oregon. Um, they uh, tend to um, cost more to administer. Um, a a uh, congressional research study that uh, went over to New Zealand and examined how they administer uh, their road user charge found that um, uh, per unit of revenue generated road, road user charge might cost 10 times as much to administer as a fuel tax. Um, uh, because they are charging simply per unit distance rather than per unit of fuel, um, road user charges, while they have that uh, increased equity on the basis of fuel efficiency, they lose the Pigovian nature of current fuel taxes from an environmental perspective. So that is uh, another aspect to keep in mind. We um, calculated for each state what, uh, based on the current state revenue and VMT, what the uh, equivalent road user charge uh, per mile would have to be. This is in cents per mile for each state in order to generate the same level of revenue. Um, compared to the fuel tax rates that I showed before, um, the, uh, the uh, road user charges would have a um, a very high, uh, an even higher variability uh, between the smallest states and the lowest, although most states, as you can see in the graph, would have a fairly similar rate. Um, the, there was a difference of about four times between the smallest state fuel taxes versus the largest state fuel taxes, and that difference becomes uh, roughly five to six times uh, as much for um, road user charges. Um, New Jersey would have uh, 
a rate of uh, only six and a half cents per mile um, compared to uh, the highest rate, which is uh, just across the border of 32.2 cents. Um, another thing to talk about is road user charges uh, face the issue of how do you administer the charge as vehicles cross the state boundaries. Um, and that is uh, an area where mega regions could come in with state cooperation. Um, I mentioned New Zealand as an example, and uh, one reason why it might not be the best example is uh, because it does have that isolation. That means there's not an issue of um, border crossing to contend with. Uh, aside from road user charges, uh, congestion pricing is also a concept that's been growing in popularity. Uh, from an um, administrative perspective, you can ex look at congestion pricing, um, statewide congestion pricing as something similar to RUC with just a variable rate depending on when and where the driving occurs. Um, but because the uh, because it has additional implementation challenges, it might be even further off than road user charges. So the last thing I'll talk about is the role of mega regions and uh, conclusion. Um, so I've mentioned how uh, mega regions could provide an opportunity for states to coordinate best practices on implementing some of these new financing mechanisms. Um, they can also uh, find strategies to reduce the higher administrative costs that come with some of these financing strategies. They um, could play a role in ensuring more uniformity. Um, in that example where you are uh, crossing from, uh, for example, Philadelphia suburbs in New Jersey into Philadelphia, you'd be going from six and a half cents per mile charges to um, over 32 cent uh, charges. So uh, mega region coordination could um, help set up a way for states to avoid that issue and create a more uniform experience for road users and particularly for um, uh, freight carriers that uh, do the most uh, state boundary crossing. So I discussed the state fuel taxes and how they vary between states, um, looking particularly at uh, how the state uh, gasoline and diesel tax rates tend to um, be more similar than the federal rates. Uh, we examined how, uh, how much freight vehicles pay in the current funding strategy uh, versus light duty vehicles. And we also examined what uh, future road user charges might look like, uh, what the equivalent rate would be in order to uh, provide similar funding. So now I'll answer any questions you'll have. Um, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Rydell. Um, generally, uh, uh, we can take questions either in the chat and I can read them out loud, or if uh, I think you can, anybody who would like to can be unmuted uh, to ask their question directly. So um, do we have any specific, like, questions that are coming from any of our guests? Hi, Sandra. I, I will jump in. Min Zhao here. Hi, Dr. Zhao. Hi, Radha. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Hear from you. Thank you for, uh, for sharing your work with Dr. Watton. Um, it's a, a transportation financing, specifically uh, the fuel taxing. And yeah, this is a general discussion debate or, or concern over is a uh, tr transportation financing relying depending on uh, fuel tax and it's ongoing, right? It may not be sustainable given uh, 
uh, given the uh, high cost and the, the rising cost of uh, maintaining the existing infrastructure uh, or uh, trying to uh, meet the uh, demand growth. And particularly, this is a new technology. Uh, the it, it did mention that VMT-based uh, taxing rather than fuel-based. So I wonder uh, if you have uh, some kind of a, a numeric assessment of uh, the impact of the uh, e-cars on, the, on the on the uh, uh, gap of. Uh, uh, Highway of financing. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. We've had for a long time now, we've had th three factors in play. We've had rising uh, transportation infrastructure costs, which you mentioned. We've had um, inflation, of course, and then we've had increasing uh, fuel efficiency. All of these lead to diminishing real uh, state fuel tax or well, diminishing real fuel tax revenue. Um, I think e-cars are not going to change the general trend. Uh, they contribute to the rising uh, average fuel efficiency and uh, could exacerbate that. So I think we'll see the same uh, e-cars e will contribute to the same thing that's been happening for uh, decades now and could um, potentially... Um, accelerate the amount to which the uh, average fuel efficiency contributes to diminishing revenues. Um, that, so that would be um, one factor that contributes even more towards uh, road user charges um, being a uh, favorable option for states to avoid having um, a significant number of road users not paying for the infrastructure. Um, I referenced in the uh, presentation that there is the side issue that um, there are many reasons we would want to incentivize e-vehicles. So it might be important to uh, in the future have transportation financing that separates the environmental externalities of driving versus the um, infrastructure payments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, it's a, uh, it's, it's a policy uh, that could have uh, multiple consequences, some are positive, some are negative. And the other day, uh, I read a report by uh, Texas Arlington, UT Arlington, look at the TO, uh, potential TOD effects and saying that, well, TOD reduces, TOD helps reduce uh, driving, but it will uh, affect tech stock in terms of uh, transportation financing because people will drive less. And then, uh, so uh, depending on which perspective you're looking at. Yeah. I actually had a question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty new to um, transportation topics in general. So uh, forgive me like, if my question's a bit naive, but um, your you shared some of these uh, images where the Northeast had a really different rate uh, compared to what would be the Southern states. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering in terms of freight transportation, um, is it uh, because some of the larger or the Southern states, which are larger and more rural have like longer distances for freight travel as opposed to the Northeast that we're seeing that, that these finance charges and everything um, are fluctuating in this way? If you could explain that more, or, or is that part of your research? Um, that's not something we directly focused on, but um, one general trend, let me uh, pull up the uh, map of the f uh, gasoline on the left and the diesel on the right. Um, and it, it's a common trend, not just for fuel taxes, but for, um, all levels of government that uh, a lot of these southern states tend to have um, fewer and smaller taxes. Um, I, I couldn't answer specifically for fuel taxes um, 
what factors are at play that have caused the um, discrepancy between the Northeast and the South. I did look more into um, Pennsylvania specifically, so I can talk about that a little bit because they um, operate things fairly differently. They uh, used to have separate um, excise taxes paid at the fuel stations in, a, in addition to wholesale taxes. Um, and then a couple decades ago, they eliminated the excise tax and now only have the wholesale tax. Um, they also have a longer history than other states with um, it being one of the first, first states where fuel exploration occurred. Um, so uh, it could be historical factors at play. Uh, the reason that they um, have today a higher rate overall and a, a different um, type of administration. Um, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question more specifically, though. Uh, it was pretty vague. I guess I was kind of curious in terms of um, if freight was a, something that there was more movement within like southern regions because it's closer to the southern border or um, generally like the states being smaller and therefore, as you said, like New Jersey and Pennsylvania having such a discrepancy, um, if that was kind of impacting how freight uh, moved in those regions. But uh, again, like I, I'm new to the concept, so just kind of curious, maybe I'm asking a question that's a little left field. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be uh, a, good, um, a good thing for future research is if you could um, find data to look at some of the smaller states that have uh, large discrepancies with their neighbors in the rates. Uh, and to look at whether that has at all influenced some of the long distance freight trips. Do, um, do we see any uh, um, trend of trucks waiting until they get uh, past Pennsylvania to refuel, for example? Um, so that, that would be uh, something interesting to examine and something that uh, would definitely be important for mega regions to uh, have that information so that they can better coordinate between states. But um, it's not something that we've been able to um, suss out of the data that we have. Okay, thank you. I had one more additional question. Um, I don't know if you can or uh, so if you were able to look at this, but um, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang did mention about e-vehicles and um, I guess also automated vehicles. Um, how is there, I guess, more of a trend in, in really looking at either road user charges or congestion pricing um, across many states. I know you talked about the difference for federal and state, but is maybe there an example of like a, a mega region that's already kind of tried to get that kind of collaboration going and, and, and work on that? The, um, I believe it's the Midwest mega region. Uh, they've uh, set up a research project between I want to say it was Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan to examine feasibility. Um, but I'm, I'm not too aware of uh, very many um, multi-state collaborations looking specifically at um, road user charges. Uh, there have been um, uh, some individual states have done uh, pilot programs. Uh, Oregon tested one. Um, but as of now, I'm not aware of too much, um, uh, too much multi-state collaboration. And where there has been, it's been uh, fairly small scale so far. OK, thank you. Um, 
Well, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll go ahead and the transfer from Rydell's presentation to Zhu Yang Li's presentation. Um, so Zhu Yang, uh, as I mentioned earlier when I introduced him, uh, will be talking about a scheduling algorithm for hurricane evacuation. So I'll take it over for you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for introducing me. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Yes, hello, um, I am Jiyong Li, and this is the presentation of uh, title uh, Strategic Evacuation for Hurricanes and Other Regional Events with and Without Autonomous Vehicles. So to start on with the background, um, we have to, this is a problem solving a transportation assignment problem. And usually when, when we are solving this kind of problem, uh, we assume that the travel demand data uh, that has uh, who departs from where to where at what time, that's the travel demand data. And we assume these are given, but since evacuation is a very rare case, uh, this kind of data was not well established so that a model estimate is needed to start on the research. And as a general statement of the evacuation, a well-timed and directed evacuation is important since too short evacuation time may cause internal gridlock effect in the traffic network and cause congestion, while too long evacuation time may result in an inefficient evacuation. And to facilitate timely and efficient evacuation, I'm assuming that there will be uh, privately owned autonomous vehicles in the network and then see how they impact the evacuation performance by different penetration rates. So uh, to start on with the network design, um, the study area for this research is Houston Galveston area with eight counties. And this is the link and note map used in the um, analysis. The link represents road segments while node represents uh, the intersection where different links meet with each other. And then this is the traffic analysis zone so in each zone, there will be there can be several links and nodes that consist this uh, eight county Houston Galveston region in Texas. So the evacuation setting uh, from the population data set, um, I assume that there will be 4.4 million vehicles with 3,600 links, 1,800 nodes, and 5,200 traffic analysis zones. And in each TAZ, um, I would assume that the vehicles inside the TAZ will be proportional to the population in that TAZ. And then once the total amount of vehicles departing in each TAZ was defined, then a link inside the TAZ will be randomly chosen as the origin of each household vehicle. And due to the computing power limit, I've only sampled 0.1% household vehicles. And this is the algorithm to be presented uh, in this uh, study. So I'm using a traffic simulator named SUMO, uh, which stands for Simulation of Urban Mobility. It's a large scale open source mesoscopic uh, traffic assignment tool that's, that can track each individual vehicle. So it's an agent based model. And it also reflects uh, destination and route choices using the Tracy API function. And I used uh, Tax Stampede 2 supercomputer uh, to optimize the departure times and destinations. And since it's an optimization problem, um, there are decision variables that I've defined. And the first variable is the departure duration, the duration from the first to the last departure and the departure time schedule, which is the proportion of vehicles departing in each time interval T. So in this research, I assume there will be five intervals within the total T duration. And then in each uh, interval, there will be PI uh, vehicle share departing for the interval I. And then in the simulator, uh, it runs in each uh, simulation time step in one second 
and then vehicles will depart based on a Poisson random number generator within each time interval to follow the PMP plan. And this is the flood modeling because uh, we're, evacu we're simulating evacuation. So first we need a disaster model to trigger the evacuation. And this is the Hurricane Harvey flood data obtained in August 27, 2017. And this is the date when the uh, severe flood started in this region in 2017. So we're simulating Hurricane Harvey uh, across this eight county region. And we've defined 10 hypothetical shelters. They are high schools located outside of this uh, Texas Beltway 8. And the definition of evacuation is the arrival at one of the shelters. And each shelter will have a capacity val value, and the shelter with lower volume to capacity ratio has higher chance to be selected as a destination. So this means if there's uh, plenty of seats, empty seats left in the shelter, it has higher chance to be selected. And the, lastly, the timing issue. Uh, let's say there are two hypothetical evacuees, one and two, and for evacuee one's uh, flood time of his house was at this point, and he decided to leave his home at that point, his departure time. So his case is a late departure, and from the departure until arrival is the travel time. But for evacuee two, uh, he was a little bit more cautious than evacuee one, so he departed earlier than the flood onset and this is the travel time. So from this um, re result, we can see that there are three variables that we have to think of. The, uh, the travel time and the late or early departure and the evacuation timing problem. So the objective is the sum of the travel time or the late or early departure time cost and we seek to find the PNT combination that can minimize the average evacuation cost among all the evacuees. And as I mentioned earlier, there are autonomous vehicles assumed in this uh, simulation to facilitate timely and efficient evacuation. This is the flow and density map uh, with respect to the autonomous vehicle proportion, the AV penetration rate, so if there are no autonomous vehicles, the capacity will be 3,000 as shown here with the blue line. While if there is full AV penetration rate, the capacity will increase to this 5,000 value. And AVs are assumed to have shorter reaction time than human drivers uh, so that uh, they have better vehicle performance. And in this simulation, I assume three different penetration rate scenarios, namely 0, 50, and 100% penetration rate. So this is the overall algorithm that I've defined to solve this problem. And I'm using genetic algorithm for the optimization problem uh, with the settings as below. So I'm going to present the simulation results. Uh, this is the optimization results after 50 iterations. And uh, here, this is the AV 100% case compared to AV zero case. So we can see that uh, more AVs results in lower evacuation costs due to uh, better vehicle performance. And this is the departure and arrival curve for three different scenarios. This is the, uh, here's the vehicle count and percentage, and this is the simulation time. And the time when uh, everyone departed is the variable P, and the shape of this departure curve is the variable P. And from the departure until arrival was simulated using the SUMO traffic simulator. And this is the optimization result of P and T variables. And from the results, we can see that uh, the early departure slot was heavily used for all three scenarios. And the T variable was not that much sensitive to AV's penetration rate. But we've seen that the evacuation costs were sensitive to AV rate. So uh, evacuation cost was studied deeply. 
So this is the kernel density estimate, uh, which means it's the curve fitting result of the histogram for evacuation cost and travel time. And here from the uh, curve and also from the average values, we can say that the AVs will deliver lower travel times and costs and results in much less uncertainty in order following and enables uh, efficient evacuation. And one advantage that we can say also is because AVs have lower travel time uh, compared to no AV case, uh, the AV evacuees can avoid evolving flood threats while they are traveling. And this improvement comes from the congestion, uh, low congestion with more AVs. Uh, the congestion index is uh, defined as the experienced travel time over the hypothetical free flow time if the vehicle was traveling at speed limit. So if this value is close to one, the vehicle was traveling in speed limit while having higher congestion index means uh, it was experiencing severe congestion. And AVs tend to have lower congestion index and that results in having low um, travel time and lower evacuation costs. And the right side graph shows the network clearance time. Uh, so network clearance time is defined as the time when the last vehicle arrived at one of the shelter so that there's no more evacuate to be evacuated. And this network clearance time falls uh, with more AVs in the simulation. So I've simulated uh, each scenario five times and these are the five results for each five different simulations. But the problem is still in the best case, uh, we still need uh, overall three to four days to evacuate everyone. So this is still problematic that we there's still more um, space for us to do to facilitate the evacuation. And this is the scenario analysis with the values. And this is the optimal T variable. And this is the optimal uh, P variable. And this is the result that I've presented for the AV 0% case while the second column and third column represents early departure. So this is the combination of optimal T and the panic departure where everyone departed during the first time slot, while the third column is the optimal P combined with a smaller T variable. So both represents early departure case and thus they have lower clearance time because uh, they departed earlier, so they de they arrived earlier, so the clearance time is low. But since uh, the vehicle concentration was high compared to the optimal case, uh, it has a higher congestion index, and this results in having higher evacuation cost and longer travel time. So this case was not optimal compared to the optimal combination. While the fourth column represents the late departure case, where a larger T variable was combined with uh, the optimal P variable. And in this case, uh, this means the vehicle departure was uh, sparsely distributed so that uh, vehicle congestion concentration was low, have, it has low congestion index, and it thus has lower travel time. But in this case, the clearance time was high because there are some evacuees who departed too late and thus also has a higher average evacuation cost. And this is also not uh, the optimal case compared to the uh, first column. And lastly, this is the spatial distribution of the evacuees uh, of the average values of each TAZ's um, uh, evacuees departing at this, this uh, TAZ. So we can see that for Regardless of the AV rate, the departure time was subject to the TAZ's uh, time of flooding. And the arrival time, um, it resembles the first slide, the departure slot slide. So we can say that early departure results in early arrival. But one problem that we can see here is that 
these people, uh, these residents departed quite late, but arrived quite early, while these residents departed quite early, but arrived uh, quite late. And that's because their travel time was high. So the coastline TAZs uh, spent longer time for traveling compared to the inner uh, land part. And when we think of the evacuation cost, this is the evacuation cost for different AV scenarios. We can identify the underserved TAZs during evacuation that needs uh, special help and special rescue plan. The current conclusion so far is as follows. Uh, the departure time schedule and duration are sensitive to time of flooding and more AEVs deliver better evacuation performance and optimal combination of the PNP variable was essential for the evacuation performance. And uh, we've identified the underserved TAZs to facilitate the evacuation. And lastly, in the best case, uh, still we have to spend three to four days to evacuate everyone. And the evacuees still have to spend 10 to 13 hours traveling on the roads due to congestion. So the future topics that we're currently working on is as follows. The first one is uh, operating a centrally managed bus fleet, uh, temporarily uh, working on a temporarily installed um, pickup station. So it comes from the idea that with more high occupancy vehicles, uh, we can lower the congestion and increase the system benefits. So we're going to operate a bus in vulnerable areas and car for carless groups to help them uh, evacuate more efficiently. And then the second one is improvement of this uh, bus operation by using uh, dynamic rest sharing autonomous vehicles. So they are um, autonomous vehicles working on uh, similar uh, strategies that Uber Pool is using right now. So uh, instead of you going to the pickup station to get the bus, uh, autonomous vehicle will be coming to your house so we can provide door-to-door -door service while the vacuum waits at home safely. So we hope that these two uh, future topics can improve the evacuation performance that we have identified in this research result. So this is all I have prepared for this uh, presentation and I will be happy to have any question or suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is a really interesting topic. I grew up along the coast and evacuation is always such a, such a tricky decision for individuals. Um, and I, a lot of my questions that I kind of have been thinking about um, are on what you propose as far as a, a, a bus service for people who don't have vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if there are any questions, I don't want to ask like another big question. If there are any questions from um, our other guests, uh, please let me know. I mean, you have a question? Yes, I, I will uh, start again. I hope other attendees will uh, ask questions as well. On um, the brown bag, uh, initially, was designed to have informal conversations uh, between the CM2 uh, researchers, a student and uh, faculty researchers. So it do not have to be that formal. Any thoughts, any ideas uh, you may have, just, um, just jump in. And uh, for you, uh, Jung Yu, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your work with Dr. Uh, Kakaman. Yes, I, I have uh, several questions, maybe uh, a small one and then uh, a, a big one, and then I have a crazy one, then I'll, I'll leave that, reserve that, leaving time for others. Small one for clarification, when you say privately owned AV, autonomous vehicle, what do you mean by that? It's a private, means an individual house, uh, household owned AV or uh, operated by a private company. The small question is slightly bigger question, and is the disasters like a, a, a hurricane 
when they arrive, they affect infrastructure a lot more than vehicles, I would say. And so in your simulation, you consider the uh, vehicle supply. Then uh, have you consider or, or would you consider say uh, AV in a scenario that different parts of the infra infrastructure in, uh, in the region, uh, different uh, levels of uh, damages to the infrastructure caused by flooding. So uh, that will affect your simulation outcome spatial spatial and in other dimensions uh, dramatically. So. Yes, yes. Uh, our first answer to the first question about the definition of the privately owned vehicles. So mm -hmm. I was using that word to define they are privately owned vehicles for each household, so not for like um, companies owned by like, let's say, a taxi company or such private taxi company they that not defined in this um simulation and i was using the privately owned to differentiate with the dynamic ride sharing autonomous vehicles because um i'm using two autonomous vehicles in this presentation so i had to clarify what privately owned is compared to dynamic ride sharing is so privately owned vehicle means a vehicle owned by a household, while the dynamic ride sharing vehicle is a vehicle owned by some organizations. It can be a private company or it can be uh, government facilities and organizations that has specific um, uh, strategy and central control over uh, com compared to the privately owned um, individual vehicles. And for the second question about the infrastructures, um, so that is affected by the flood modeling. Yes, in here. So one thing that we we're thinking of for the infrastructure modeling was uh, the road closure closure during the a disaster because uh, roads can be closed and we may not use certain road segment during the evacuation and then that will affect the route choice for instance let's say if this uh, major interstate highway was closed that will significantly affect people living in let's say like here in Galveston mm -hmm. or if this uh, bridge was closed that's a very severe problem for a resident in Galveston. So that kind of road closure uh, can be simulated and we were planning to apply the, uh, let's say like flood modeling, more uh, detailed flood modeling by having a certain threshold value so that if the roads uh, uh, flood uh, in is over a certain threshold, assume that road is closed and then we cannot use that road during the route choice. Um, so that kind of um, plans are in our uh, future topic area that I haven't presented yet. And also we can um, control the route choice for the dynamic route sharing autonomous vehicles so that um, they can be uh, managed and controlled to use certain routes or so avoid certain routes um, but that's for the future plan and they're not applied in this research, research yet. Thank you. Uh, Rydell, you had a question, um, if you'd like to share, please. Um, thank you for the presentation, Jiyoung. Um, since AVs potentially have a fairly long time horizon for uh, adoption, I wondered if you could speak a bit about the decisions y'all made uh, about um, in that same time period, we would expect um, increasingly severe flooding uh, and increasing congestion. Um, so if you could just talk a bit about the decisions y'all made about uh, 
which uh, population distribution to use in your simulations and uh, flood severity. Yes, uh, so that's one of the uh, review results that we've got while we were peer reviewing this research. The, so AV0 and AV100% makes sense, but the problem is AV50% case because um, autonomous vehicles will be expensive at first uh, adoption stage. And then we have to define who will buy if there's half AVs and half um, human driven vehicles. So yeah, one of the re previous research results that I've done is that um, the adoption of autonomous vehicles, privately owned autonomous vehicles will be starting in like 2035. So uh, this uh, AV 100% scenario can be uh, seen like in decades. But what we can think of is, it's still related to the future topics, but having a privately owned autonomous vehicle will be not, um, cannot be seen in the early stage, but we can see, we may see dynamic ride sharing autonomous vehicles because that's what uh, Uber is willing to do in, in a like, few decades, I think like in 20 years. So I'm more relying on dynamic ride sharing autonomous vehicles to be seen on the roads within like 10 or 20 years. But yes, the adoption of privately owned vehicles, autonomous vehicles can be um, not that much promising in their early uh, years. For your simulations, did y'all um, factor in the like block level average income into uh, <clears throat> It, like for the 50% case, did you make that 50%, 50% uh, across the board or did you uh, make it higher in areas with higher income and lower in areas with lower income? Yeah, that, that's, that was one of the, like the review results that I've got. And so currently it's uniformly distributed and then we're going to weight the vehicle ownership by the TAZ's income level to represent the like the income state for each TEZ. But to answer the question, yes, uh, it's uniformly distributed at this level. Okay. Thank you for answering the question. Mm -hmm. Quickly, uh, Joyo, if uh, other people don't have question. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I, I noticed that uh, we're uh, running over time. And for a, a hurricane, a specific uh, hurricane related uh, evacuation, actually, Many people uh, evacuate and then travel uh, to other cities, uh, other regions outside uh, the affected area. So if you, uh, of course, that's a different topic. Uh, I remember during uh, Katrina that my home population increased from three to 14 plus two dogs. Uh, the increased population uh, all came from Houston on the evacuation. So if you change, the distribution of uh, the uh, evacuation destinations uh, mm -hmm. within the region versus uh, outside the region, uh, that probably will uh, have a different uh, simulation outcome, I guess. Yes, that, that's, yes, that's the shelter problem, the destination problem that we were uh, also trying to solve. Like, we can't ignore those going outside of Houston, so having like assuming the shelter is one of here, one of this location to go to, let's say there's um, Dallas, Fort Worth in this direction. So that's uh, also in the future topics to define the exact shelters and the locations. But yes, that, thank you for the comment. We will think of good destination choice model if we can reach one. Great. Well, there are no uh, further questions from our guests. And um, I just want to say thank you again to Zhu Yang and Rydell for your presentations. Those were both really interesting topics. Um, and uh, we will be posting this uh, recording on our website within the next week. Uh, so it can be shared and viewed by additional guests. So thank you, everyone, for your time and have a great afternoon.
Thank you, Sandra, for organizing. Thank, thank you, Reda, and good luck with your degree. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.